In early 1927, Austin, Texas announced plans to hold an 82-mile run from San Antonio to Austin featuring three Tarahumara Indian runners. The race was part of the Texas relays put on there by the University of Texas. Many wondered and speculated how the Tarahumara would fare running outside Mexico for the first time. In the lower altitude of Texas, it is believed the Indians should be able to do much better. They are expected to have little trouble in annihilating distance records. Some Americans were fearful that Mexico would gain an advantage at the next Olympics by including the Tarahumara. They felt comfort to know that Tarahumaras couldn't bring their Tesquino across the border into Texas and their bare feet would be running on hot pavement instead of hard packed dirt. But then it was reported that they could protect their feet with homemade sandals made from goat skin with leather thongs to wrap around bandaged ankles. A New York Times sport columnist who was a Tarahumara skeptic wrote, This time they will run a distance measured in English miles and they will be timed by a split second watch. Though for that matter, in an 82 mile race, an alarm clock would do just as well. Upon receiving the invitation to compete, Mexican officials immediately started to train candidates for the race. They felt that with this new venue, they could further prove doubters wrong and bring greater respect to Mexico. On February 27, 1927, in Mexico, 15 Tarahumara villages competed with 60 athletes to identify three men and three women to send to Texas to run the 82-mile and marathon events. The elimination trials created great excitement among the Tarahumara, developing sharp rivalry among the different villages. The event became the biggest race ever held up to that time among the Tarahumara. In the main event, 26 Tarahumara men ran in a 91-mile race and three men were selected. Women competed in a 45-kilometer distance, but their times were not considered very extraordinary, with 4 hours 46 minutes. The final runners were chosen. Mexican authorities were still uncertain if they had selected the best runners of the tribe because they believed the best runners were never seen anywhere near the villages. The men eventually selected were Jose Torres, 24, Tomas de Frivo, 38, and Agustin Salido. The women were just girls. Lola's Cusare, 18, Juanita Cusare, 14, and Juanita Paciencia. 16. The plans for this historic race met a serious snag when it was reported that immigration authorities in El Paso, Texas refused to allow two of the runners from entering the United States on the grounds that they were illiterate and contract laborers. An immediate appeal was made to the Secretary of Labor in Washington, D.C. Newspapers mocked this immigration controversy. There could be no danger in letting in the Tarahumara Indians, for it seems that nobody at present in the United States would find his job endangered by their competition. Nobody in America right now is making a living doing 60 miles running stunts at the rate they achieve. A day later, everything was resolved with the help of Senator Earl B. Mayfield of Texas. The runners would not enter the country as immigrants, they would enter solely to take part in athletic events and were under the authority of the Department of Education. On March 21st, 1927, a party of 10 Tatahumara crossed the border into the United States to compete on U.S. soil for the first time. The 10 were six runners, an interpreter, a trainer, a chaperone, and a manager. The men would run in the 82-mile race and the women in the marathon. While on a train to Austin, three of the runners suffered minor burns on their bare feet from steam heating pipes in the Pullman car. When they arrived at Austin station, they came off the train clad in native dress, carting a huge store of supplies wrapped in, quote, gaudy blankets. A throng of newspaper reporters and curious onlookers met them. Tom Rodriguez was the runner's manager and was the director of the YMCA at Chihuahua City in Mexico. He watched over the runners constantly to make sure they didn't burn their feet on any more steam pipes and to caution them against the perils of automobile traffic. After their workouts the next day, the Tarahumara wanted to see more sights of the city. 
They also wanted to listen to a phonograph and to ride in an elevator. They enjoyed spending the afternoon sprawled on beds in their rooms at a hotel. On the following day, the men with their manager, Rodriguez, took an automobile ride to San Antonio to preview the course backwards and to get ready for the start there very early the next morning. The road was hard surfaced most of the way and in places covered with rough gravel. The runners shook their heads dubiously as they examined the highway, knowing that they would need to run in their sandals. Salido had never seen an airplane before, and when one swooped down near the car, he became consumed with fear for the majestic birds soaring above him. At 3.19 a.m., the race from San Antonio to Austin began. The race was actually just a Tarahumata exhibition. No U.S. athletes were in the race. But the event was the central event of the Texas Relays. The Austin paper wrote, It is truly a landmark in athletic history in the world, as it is the first race of its kind to be staged in this nation. It was billed as an 82-mile race, but turned out to be 89.4 miles. They ran in bare feet on the asphalt highway through the cool morning and only put on their sandals for the cruelest stretches. There were other difficulties. The men battled their way to Austin through a barrage of carbon monoxide gas with hundreds of automobiles that congested the highways. At about 9 a.m., they put on their wide sombreros, not to shade their faces, but to rest their arms. As the morning sun heated up, Water was squeezed from a sponge on their heads and thrown on their bodies. They fed on panole, ground maize mixed with brown sugar, which they ate out of little earthen bowls. The halfway point was reached at Hunter, where they reached in less than seven hours and soon passed the 50-mile mark. Torres and Safiro were in the lead, with Salido a mile or so behind. Salido was soon attacked by stomach cramps and slowed two miles behind. The two in the lead slowed, hoping that he would catch up. But when they arrived at the 100 kilometer mark at noon, Salido was far behind. He arrived there two hours later, collapsed, and was then brought by automobile to Austin. Torres and Safiro didn't show any signs of weakening and continued along the road that was filled with cars, crowds, and motorcycles that rode along with them. One observer wrote, the runners were greeted along the road by the Mexican population enthusiastically, as well as the Americans. The Mexicans would rush to the runners with gifts. One man gave each of the boys a plaster of Paris black and white cow, while an old waterman emptied his pockets of coins into the hands of the runners. After they entered the stadium, Torres and Safiro ran around the track and then threw the finishing tape covered 89.4 miles in 14 hours, 46 minutes to the thunderous acclaim of 10,000 spectators. They finished in nearly perfect condition except for their feet were cut to shreds by the asphalt. The women's marathon was also ran that day. It turned out to be 28.5 miles. They started in front of the American Statesman newspaper building at 11.34 a.m. Lola had been very ill before leaving Mexico, and the manager, Rodriguez, had given strict orders for her to not run before he left for San Antonio with the men. She disobeyed him and towed the start line. They wore their native sandals and carried cane poles about four feet long and were paced by their trainer and chaperone who rode in cars. They ran with long, easy strides and stayed close together until Juanita Pacencia had trouble with one of her sandals that came loose. She finally threw them both off and tried to catch up with the leading two. They arrived at the turnaround halfway mark at 2 hours 17 minutes with Pacencia about 1.5 miles behind. Her trainer tried to convince her to drop out, but she refused, but eventually did have to stop. Cars crowded the runners, and at one time the fumes were so bad that the women were forced to stop for a while. Juanita Cuseri dropped out with about only two miles to go because of exhaustion and pain in her feet from the heat of the pavement. Crowds lined the road back to Austin and cheered loudly. Lola finished in the stadium with a time of four hours and 20 minutes. A witness wrote, She did not fall to the ground gasping for breath. She joined her companions who she had left behind, greeted them, and turned a suspicious eye toward cameramen and newspapermen who crowded around her for photos. 
Lola then jogged around the stadium ground for ten minutes until her chaperone finally succeeded in making her stop as other events were going on. The Austin newspaper reported, The stunt went over with such a bang and proved to be so popular that the eyes of the entire world were focused upon the Indians. A Mexico newspaper published a banner headline in Spanish, The Tarahumaru accomplished their great feat. It was also written that in Mexico, the foot runners reigned in Mexico's imaginations as the heroes. With that, this is Davy Crockett, and this is the Ultra Running History Podcast. I hope you run fast and far, enjoy life, get outdoors, and most of all, stay safe and don't take unnecessary chances. Mm-hmm.